now hit the mainstream. With new technologies, support from across the political spectrum, and advocates from Stephen Hawking to Mark Zuckerberg, it's no surprise that people have begun to take the prospect seriously. So for tonight's head-to-head, -head, or today's head-to-head, -head, we're asking universal basic income, is it time? We've got two fantastic speakers. Um, on my right is Guy Standing, who has written widely on areas of labor economics, labor market policy, unemployment, labor market flexibility, structural adjustment policies, and social protection. He is the world's leading authority on universal basic income. On my left is Deidre McCloskey, acclaimed libertarian, author, and historian. In 2013, she received the Julian L. Simon Memorial Award from the Competitive Enterprise Institute for her work examining factors in history that led to the advancement in human achievement and prosperity. So I'd like to ask uh, Guy Standing to open tonight, today's debate. Well, thank you very much. I've been working on basic income for over 30 years, and for many of those years, I was regarded as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. And as Peter's just said, suddenly I'm becoming respectable. I'm becoming very worried about this because I've never wanted to mix with a company that many of those who are coming out in favor. But I think it's indicative of a perfect storm of factors that are precipitating basic income to the middle of our political discourse. And before I say what that perfect storm is, let me just make it clear to those of you who are not familiar with the debates, that what we mean by a basic income is that every man and every woman and every child at a lower level would receive a regular payment from the state in money form with no conditions, no behavioral conditions. You don't have to do this or that or that or prove something. You get it as an economic right. And it would be non-withdrawable. It would be a permanent citizenship right or a legal resident right. We can come back to the issue of defining what we mean by universalism. But the essence of it is that everybody would have basic income security. Now, you can have a very low level and you can raise it, or you can have a higher level, etc. That is a separate issue. But the important thing is to realize that the reason someone like myself supports moves towards having a basic income for all of us is fundamentally ethical, not economic. It's ethical, first of all, because it's a matter of social justice. I strongly resent the title of our session, Money for Nothing. A lot of wealthy people in this country get a lot of money for nothing. Yes. <laughs> and I, res I resent it because if you go back to the history of the discourse around basic income and you go back to the Charter of the Forest in 1217 and through Thomas Paine and so on, essentially what we're saying is that the wealth of all of us, the income of all of us, is far more to do with the efforts and achievements of many generations before us. And if you accept private inheritance of wealth, something for nothing if you notice, then we should have a sense of a social dividend on the collective wealth because we don't know whose ancestors produced the wealth. Maybe yours, maybe yours, maybe mine, I don't know. We don't know. And in that sense, we need to give a social justice orientation for it. Now, if you are religious, I'm not religious, but if you are, and many people have come at it from a religious point of view, you can say that God has given us unequal talents and in a sense a basic income would be a compensation to those who don't, for one reason or another, have the same talents as others. You can also approach it as a matter of ecological justice. One minute. So for me, the justice orientation of a basic income is fundamental. The second ethical reason is it would enhance freedom. It would enhance Freedom in the libertarian sense, it would enhance freedom in the 19th century liberal sense, in the sense of avoiding a paternalistic state. Classic statement from T.H. Green is you can only be moral if you're in a position to be moral. And it's also a matter of freedom from a republican freedom tradition. 
it's a sense of giving people, even a small amount, the ability to say no and the ability to feel that you are not subject to power that's unaccountable. And the third reason, and then I'll stop, but I think this is fundamental, is that almost by definition a basic income would give people basic security. We are facing a plague of insecurity and the psychologists have taught us that insecure people have a suffering of a lower IQ, a smaller mental bandwidth. They cannot behave rationally because they are under stress. And that's a reality. Security is a human need and a basic income would move us in that direction. Before we go any further, it's not a panacea. It has to be seen as a 21st century part of a progressive politics. And that is the argument that I've advanced in the book and I hope we will discuss it around that. Thank you. Well, this was staged as, as a debate because uh, the organizers think of me as a conservative. Uh, I think they think I'm a Tory or something. And, and actually, I'm a, I'm a, a to, to, to use this word I don't like much, I'm, I'm a libertarian. But I'm a bleeding heart libertarian. I am a Christian. I'm an Anglican. Uh, the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury is not first in my thoughts, but I think he's very nice. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm a liberal. I'm a 19th century liberal. But I, I would call it a... a, a, a a party or a view that wants to treat everyone like adults, wants to be fair. And I certainly strongly agree with, with uh, Guy's point that an unconditional subsidy to people without, as you said, without behavioral conditions, you, you can't drink, well, look, most of you are drinking here, um, you can't. Uh, you can't be gay. You can't be this. You can't be that. I, I of course, don't want that. And that—that's a very attractive part of this, this, this way of thinking. And indeed, it's been an attractive part for a long time among economists. In the 1950s, James Tobin, mildly on the left, a Keynesian at Yale, and Milton Friedman, a co former colleague of mine at the University of Chicago. Um, both proposed a what they what 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 Milton called the negative income tax to g give exactly such a supplement to the poor, with the proviso that we drop all the conditional grants that we st that we stop trying to push people around. In a way, that's the basic liberal idea. And uh, historically speaking, it's very strange. It's an 18th century conviction among a bunch of intellectuals, Mary Wollstonecraft and, Kraft and, and uh, Voltaire and, Ma and Adam Smith. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, and it, it, it's a, uh, uh, so, so it's, it, it's, it's the idea that the, 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 the liberal idea is that you ought to treat people with respect as adults and let them make their own lives. And as a Christian, as this bleeding heart part, I'm very willing to help them um, on their own terms, not on mine. I don't insist that they uh, pledge allegiance to the Chicago School of Economics or something like that. Um, but the, the, my, my worries about it is that I don't think universal makes a lot of sense. And you can, you, you, you can see the problems. Here, here's one, ethically and philosophically. Why not a world universal income? What's this about the British why, or the Americans? Why should people, or Swiss, why should people defined by a certain national border be the ones who get the, the subsidy? For more debates, talks, and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.